The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Why do we care about this park? This slide, in case you aren't already convinced, is supposed to be convincing you about how extraordinary this concrete is. Um, and it is extraordinary not only for the quality of color, design, what they were able to accomplish. I don't know how many of you have been involved with precasting, um, but gee, that's pretty amazing. Um, but also, remember, this stuff is 80 to 100 years old. So when we started working on this park, um, we were just beginning to move into this restoration of mid-century modern and the modern stuff, and a lot of that stuff was early concrete. And there were major problems. Okay, so this is, this is going to be the what to look forward to. This is the, the, the lecture. So I'm going to do scene setting for this park. How did this park come to be here? Um, why did this park come to look like this? And so forth. So I'm going to start with geology. My son always accuses me of starting everything I say with the Russian Revolution, but this time I'm going to go back even further to Pangaea and 450 million years ago. But I'm going to try to speak fast. Okay, then I'm going to bring us forward very quickly to a little bit of American history, a bit of Washington history, and how did it happen that this park came to be located here. Then I'm going to talk about the design of the park, which is also curious, I think. The building, 21 years of construction. And then, how did J.J. Early, John Joseph Early, get involved? How did he accomplish this amazing concrete? And this is the title of my paper, Who Deserves the Credit? Because in any John Joseph Early convention, they everyone attributes this park to John Joseph Early. And in reality, he actually built very little of it. But what he did do is he invented the methods. And he invented methods that allowed other contractors to follow him and, and equal it. Then here's the epilogue. What happened after 1936 when the park was finished? Because then when we got started on it, it was like, what, another 60 years later. Um, and there was a lot of history. Um, the Depression, how the World War and the Cold War affected it, um, the Supreme Court, um, and finally what started happening after we started <laughs> fixing. Well, we can't all. I'm looking at Bob Armbruster because, of course, he was part of it. I think, and again, concrete, we're here for a concrete thing, but I think that there are some just extraordinarily curious aspects to this park. Um, here we are in the capital of the world's oldest, longest, most effectively functioning democracy, and yet the park is based on models from oligarchies from the 16th and 17th century. This is a picture of Lorenzo Medici, right? So how do you reconcile a, a park design based on his era in this country? And here's Thomas Jefferson, um, and here the park is today. You know, how, how do you put all of that together? I'm going to try to explain it anyway, I, you know, whether it makes sense, whether it's logical or not. So now we're going to go back to Pangaea, which was like the, the single monster 
continent that started pulling apart. And that was 450 million years ago. And one of the things in the Pangaea continent was the Appalachian Mountain Range, which is considered, and if we have any geologists in here, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is considered the oldest mountain range in the world. And that's our mountain range. And by the way, it's the mountain range that provided us with the aggregate that became this park, which is why I'm talking about it. Well, one reason I'm talking about it. Now, the other reason I'm talking about it is a fact of geology is something called the fall line. Okay? It goes all up and down the East Coast, and that's where all of the American colonial cities that were founded in the colonial era were put, they were put right on the fall line. What's the fall line? The fall line is where we go from, um, from plateau mountain stuff down to coastal plain. The coastal plain basically consists of stuff that is washed down from the mountains. Okay, so the coastal plain, when, when the colonists came here, this stuff was rich, 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 wonderful soil, that's where they grew tobacco until they depleted the soil. Okay, so what happens at the fall line is that most rivers go from being ocean navigable to not ocean navigable. So if you're a colonial city, you're connected to the, the mothership by seagoing ships, um, you're going to care about that a lot. But, but here you are developing the inland stuff, um, you know, all those beavers and stuff that, that you want to send back to the mother country. And so you want to be able to gather stuff here, bring it to this point, put it on an ocean-going ship, and send it away. And it may be sending stuff from Boston to Georgetown to New York to Philadelphia, whatever. It may even be colonial, colonial connections. So the fall line, there we are, the fall line. Philadelphia, Wilmington, Delaware, Baltimore, Maryland, us, which was Georgetown and Alexandria, were two port cities here before the city. Um, Richmond, uh, Petersburg, Raleigh, and so forth. So fall line, Atlantic Coastal Plain. That's why the city is here. So then, the colonies decided they'd had enough of Great Britain, who was clearly bullying us and was an economic hegemony, and we had enough of it. We had a revolution. We won. Then it wasn't immediate. We had the, the Constitutional Convention after the Articles of, of, um, of Confederation or whatever. Um, and the Congress was meeting in Philadelphia, and there were a bunch of soldiers who had not been paid for their work in the Revolutionary War. And they came to Philadelphia, and they asked for their money, apparently in a fairly aggressive way. And the city of Philadelphia, there was no federal armed forces to protect the Congress people. The city of Philadelphia didn't, didn't do as much as Congress thought they should, so they decided they wanted their own city where they could control defense of themselves. This is all about themselves. Um, and they wanted a federal enclave. So negotiate, 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 and it was all camel stuff, you know, the north and the south and who owed money. And they decided on this location, somewhere between the north and the south, a new city it was going to be federal enclave. Maryland and Virginia was, were prepared to give them some land. Um, they wanted it on the Potomac River, um, and they let King George select the location, except he wasn't King George. He could have been King George, George Washington. He was such a hero. He, he, he was so important to the young nation. And guess what? He grew up. 10 miles down the river. He knew this area extremely well. And George said, how about right here, right at the fall line of the Potomac, it's just a little below the falls, 
Um, but we'll get into that, or we won't get into it. Um, anyway, so he picked this location, and then there was this guy, Pierre Charles Lafont, and Lafont wanted to be called Peter <laughs> because he was so committed to the United States. He came over here from France to help out in the revolution. He designed fortifications for George Washington, which is how Washington knew about him. George said, he'll do. Let's get him to design the city. And Lafont was happy and indeed rose to the occasion. So Lafont was a man with a vision. And this is another little sub-theme here, which is about design, a series of designs that affected this site. Lafont was the first to affect it. And he had a vision about a capital city. Um, Thomas Jefferson actually did a scheme for the city, for the capital city, that would have put the entire capital right here. He imagined something not unlike um, um, the historic city uh, in Virginia, where we go. For Williamsburg, thank you. Um, just something tiny, a provincial capital, as it were. But Lafont, genius. He said, this country is going to go somewhere, and it is going to grow into something that we can't even imagine. And so he laid out, he laid out a huge city relative to what we needed at that point, and that was this. And this line here, this funny line, basically over here, this is the fall line. That is the fall line. There is a topographic change between where his city is and this stuff out here of between 60 to 70 feet. Now the reason Great Falls is further up the river is because these rivers cut into the Piedmont Plateau and so the actual falls move up the river. Um, but we are absolutely right here on the fall line and when Lafont came here and Congress came here. Um, there was already a little port town, Georgetown, here, and a little port town down here, Alexandria. So there was uh, there there were some other people here already, which was important for laborers and 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 where are people going to stay. Um, the whole city, this this city was based on a Ponzi scheme. Congress was broke. The country was broke. We were still paying off the debts from the revolution and there just wasn't, Congress didn't think there was money to build a capital city. So what they did is the state of Maryland, the state of Virginia gave them jurisdiction for the 10 mile square, but they didn't own the land. So Congress made a deal with the landowners, and they said, if you'll give us the land for our new city, we will subdivide it, make lots in all of these squares, impose this wonderful design, and we will pay you by giving you some lots, which will then be worth a lot more than the land is worth right now, undeveloped. So, at call it a Ponzi scheme or call it very clever financing, whatever you want to do. But that was how we got the land. Now the problem was that that began 200 years of real estate speculation. So fortunes were made and fortunes lost as people anticipated the growth of the city. So. By 1861, basically, the city went nowhere. By 1861, this is during um, the Civil War, and it's a little hard to see on this map, which is underlaid under the, the L'Enfant scheme. But this dark stuff here, the dark areas of the map, are basically where there were buildings. So here we are. 60 years, because Congress came to town in 1800, this is 51, 51 years into the nation, and this is how much of L'Enfant's plan we've occupied. So here's the fall line, and here will be Meridian Hill Park in another 50 years. 
slow growth. But then forces started converging. And they began in 1893. And somebody yesterday mentioned the Chicago World's Exposition. And that was one of the really important things that happened. The World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And it's funny, 1893, it was commemorating the 400th anniversary of Columbus arriving in this hemisphere. And if you do the math, whoops, was really the 401st anniversary, but it takes time to get things together. 1893, we, we were coming out of a Victorian era period of construction. Some people have called that the Battle of the Styles. Buildings were dark, they were picturesque, they were everything. And suddenly, 1893, the designers of this exposition had white and classical in mind. And they showed the world, they showed the city a vision of this very classical, serene, dignified thing, which all these people who were used to the Victorian stuff thought was terrific. So that's what we're thinking about is cool building city-wise. That's our image. 1900, things are starting to get stirred up because that was the centennial of the city of Washington. So our one of our major local designers, Glenn Brown, was stirring things up saying, we're going to have the National AIA convention here in 1900 and look at the city. It is a mess. We should do something. And um, Senator James McMillan, this fellow here, also under the force of 1893 and then the 1900 AIA convention where papers were presented basically talking about we could do better. <laughs> and you didn't have to do much more than look out the window to see how horrible the city was. Um, so McMillan says, let's do something. And he horses around with Congress, and he finally gets some money allocated for a park commission. And it was called the Senate Park Commission. And what he did, some of the people he put on the park commission were these four guys, all of whom, except not San Gaudan, I believe. I forget. All of these guys had been intensely involved in the white city. So you can see things coming together here. Right, you can see why the city that we five minutes left live in today looks the way it does. It's it's a version of the white city. So in only less than a year the Macmillan Commission came up with a plan. This is this is a version of well, this is the Macmillan Commission plan and it shows the parks a, a system of parks. Um, we have the George Washington Parkway and the Rock Creek Parkway and the Arboretum because of the Macmillan Commission. All of those things were ideas. Um, and what I want you to look at is this spot right here. Here's the fall line, okay? That spot right there is going to look familiar. That's our park. Okay, the Macmillan Commission, which was composed of some of the finest designers in the country at that time, said, this axis due north of the White House, 16th Street, is a really important axis. And here it is, the fall line, there's a major change of grade. And there was a person living here who had been lobbying for something on this site for 30 years. So anyway, the combination of things, they said we ought to put something right here on this axis. But you can see the subdivision, the roads and everything. It was too late to create an interruption to 16th Street. So look what we got. We got this little area here, eventually, right? There you go, falling. So this is 1901. They said, let's put a park there. Nobody knows what the park is going to look like. Nobody knows what the site's going to be used for. As a matter of fact, John Russell Pope did a scheme to put the Lincoln Memorial there. Um, and the park uh, wasn't, the site was not even acquired till 1910. And then they decided to put 
Well, the Commission of Fine Arts came first, and somebody mentioned that yesterday. They were assembled to implement the Macmillan Commission plan, which was suffering um, in the, even just the 10 years since it had been proposed. And look at our cast of characters on the Commission of Fine Arts, Chicago, three Chicago exposition people, and three stellar designers of the time. Um, CFA, well, the Macmillan Commission was the first one. They went to Europe um, as part of the commission thing. They spent seven weeks in Europe. CFA went to Europe in 1914 to look around, and then Peasley, who designed the park, went in 1914 to look around. But are we wondering how come stuff from the Medici era ended up in our park? Um, well, this is an image from the Macmillan Commission report, and look at this. This was proposed, it was never executed, but this is what they wanted. Look at this, this fountain, does it look familiar? This is in our park. So you can get a strong idea of why. Um, they hired um, somebody named George Burnap um, to design it. Uh, the, and he worked in the park from 1913 to 1914. This was his design. And I look at this design, and you can see the bones of the current park in that design, but it's sort of one of everything. It's, it's way too much stuff going on in this 12-acre site. And again, here's the fall line. And when you go to the park, you'll see that there's a huge, there's a 40-foot drop in, there's a 40-foot retaining wall. There's a 40-foot exposed aggregate concrete retaining wall, which any of us would be proud to have done 60 years from now. It is fantastic. It is in great shape. Um, so uh, Burnett left, and Horace Peasley, his assistant, um, took over from Burnett after 14. This was the approved design for the park by CFA in 1920. And this is as it was built. Um, so we've got the park. Now, the, uh, one minute. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, CFA, Burnett, Peasley, all of these guys wanted a park made out of stone, but they just couldn't afford it. This is what they wanted, right? Couldn't afford it. Not enough money. How are we going to do it? So they said, let's try it in this new material. This is an early design of some of the 16th Street walls looking like stone. You see, this looks, this is all stone broaching and, and the stuff you get from stone tools. Um, couldn't do it. So they cast a mock up. They cast a mock up and they had stucco on the middle to try and get something going on. And they all hated it. They just hated it. Um, they said it was monotonous, muddy, far from thrilling. So they hooked up with John Joseph Early, who said that he thought it was kind of an accident that he got involved in the park because he was doing this work on stucco. And they were all still thinking about a stucco surface applied to the concrete. Um, but he took it a lot further than that. And from yesterday, you've learned a little bit about him. He considered himself an architectural sculptor. And it's interesting because all these guys were talking about the concrete as ornamental. And yet, we have a 40-foot retaining wall. It was so much more than that. Um, so here's what they wanted. They didn't want drab gray. They wanted color. And you now know how we got that. It's from bits of the Appalachian mountain range that were washed down the Potomac River. They wanted texture. They didn't want monotony. Um, one of the CFA people, they were talking about this pebble dash, and early knew that there, that was just not going to be economically feasible. But in stucco, there's something called rough cast, where the aggregate is in the stucco. And so basically, um, that's what we've got. Um, so here's, this shows you some of the texture, and of course you can see the color. And then there's this huge breakthrough that he made today, and 
when I was in college, we talked about uniform grading for concrete. It was standard. Early said we need little aggregate and big aggregate to get this. And so here was what he did. And that is step grading or, let's see, gap grading. Somebody called it gap grading. Then they yanked the formwork when it was still green and scrubbed it. So they called it scrubbed concrete. Now, I know I'm out of time, but let me just tell you how they poured these things. This is a piece of the 16th Street wall that Early was in on. And the way in this wall, this section, you see there's one kind of aggregate and texture here, and there's a different one here. And over here we go big aggregate, fine, big, fine. How the heck did they do that? Um, and the way they did it, it, this is one pour. This is one pour. So what they did is they had, form, they had the formwork, and they put in a metal, a metal divider. So here's the first pour. That's a, these dotted lines are, are cold joints. So there's the first pour. Then they dropped this divider in. And meanwhile, over here on the other side of this divider, same pour, because what they did is they poured sections of the wall, a section of the wall in a pier. So section with pier, then section with pier. So this, was, this is monolithic. Um, and over here, they're pouring big aggregate, little aggregate, big aggregate, little aggregate. So after they get to this point, they put this divider in, and they pour little aggregate and big aggregate. And here's a cold joint. Then they slide this thing out, and they pour little aggregate. And then they pour big aggregate. So, and this is one of the simpler many aggregate pours in the park. There are some other ones that are just incredible. You have to see them to be believed. Another thing he did, really quick, another thing he did which was talked about yesterday was extensive, extensive use of mock-ups. And there's a major lesson for us here. Here is one of the 1914-16 mock-ups. And here's a piece of that same wall. 100 years later, extensive use of mock-ups. See, here they're mocking up. This is the 16th Street big retaining wall, and here's the low retaining wall and the high retaining wall, and they're trying to get a grip on how to cast those balusters. They did off-site casting, whereas early by 10 years later in his career is way a precaster. At this point, he is very much working on-site but I think this may be where he started um, developing some of these techniques that he did for, um, for precasting. And so here's a summary of the process, the step grading. He placed wet mixes. Um, he placed wet mixes to get them into the little cracks and stuff. And then he did all this stuff to get the excess water away, um, which as Bob told you yesterday, we couldn't do in our reconstruction. He did this amazing formwork stuff, early form stripping, the scrubbing. Then they would keep the stuff moist, so there was slow curing. And then there was the off-site stuff, where there's a lot of literature talking about what he did with that, with newspaper and stuff like that, to make a wet mix to fill the mold and then get the water out of there fast. Now, who gets the credit? Early mentions the 16th Street entrance in his 1921 patent application. We are all totally convinced he did this. Um, Horace Peasley was the architect on the site for basically 20 years. Credits early with developing the method. So we've got that too. And then in 1923, early had a contract to do paving, some paving. And that's as much documentation of the actual work he did at the site. But he also did the 16th Street wall mock-ups. I think he did a lot of that. But so who, get, who deserves the credit? Not for building the whole park, but for making this park possible in this concrete. My vote goes to, to early. So here's what we don't have time to do. Epilogue, this is a. Mary Henderson across the street who lobbied. This is 20th century, Second World War, sort of a high point for the park. 
um, used intensely. It was practically brand new. It was fantastic. Then the Supreme Court, Brown v. Board of Education, and white people fled the city. The city went into economic decline. Um, and the Cold War, the National Park Service didn't have money to take care of this guy. And so this is, this is what, look at the graffiti. This is what the park looked like 30 years ago before um, the Renaissance. Um, so that's what I told you. <laughs> that's right. 450 million years in 25 minutes.